Good morning, everybody. This is uh, this week's Encompass Live. The date is January 27th, 2010. My name is Michael Sowers, and I will be your host today. Krista is uh, out this morning, and this is the second of our two or excuse me, the second of our monthly Tech Talk uh, sessions. As you can see here, we're not in the usual room. I'm in my office, so the background's a little different. And we actually do have a webcam up and running, so you can uh, take a look at uh, my smiling face here. Uh, my camera's a little off to the side, so uh, bear with me if it doesn't seem like I'm looking directly at you. Um, a lot of you requested we had the webcam going, so uh, we figured it out. This is a test run, see how it goes and uh, we'll go from there. So as I mentioned, um, my name is Michael Sowers. I'm the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Commission. Many of you have met me already. And uh, what we're trying to do is kind of a once a month, let's get a little geeky, let's uh, talk to some people doing some innovative uh, technology things in their libraries, um, and try to answer some of your questions, and I'll talk about some of the tech news that I think you ought to be aware of, some software, things like that. And uh, continuing as I did last month, I have an interviewee uh, on the line. Uh, I have uh, Betty Oliver from Beaver City Public Library. Uh, Betty, you still there? Whoops, I have to unmute Betty. Hold on. <laughs> okay, Betty, are you there now? <laughs> Yes, I am. Okay, great. Um, Betty, before I, I tell everybody kind of why I've got you on the line, uh, you just want to take a minute or two, just tell us a little about yourselves, what's, uh, yourself, what library you're at, what you do there? I am the library director for the Beaver City Public Library. I've been here 20 years, almost 21 actually, and it's just a small library. We're from a small town of population of 640 so as you can guess I am the librarian <laughs> <laughs> you're it all right um, so uh, I'm gonna hold something up here I back in I believe it was uh, maybe December I got the uh, Valley Talk newsletter which is the RVLS newsletter there and they had this wonderful little article uh, that I just held up uh, titled uh, something new in Beaver City and it, it looks like you got a, a some sort of new piece of technology in your library what what you get we got a photo kiosk. Okay. Um, and w so what does that do? Well, people are able to bring in their digital format and print pictures within minutes here in the library now. Oh, wonderful. Um, so, okay, why would you get one of those? Can't somebody just go to, like, the Walgreens or the Walmart or something and get their <laughs> pictures done that way? Well, yes, they can, but not here in town. Like I said, it's a small town, 640 people, so there is no place here in town that offers this service, so we thought it would be a good service that the library could provide. Great. Was was this something um, patrons had suggested, or did um, you come up with this? Where did the idea come from? Well, quite by accident, actually. The grocery store manager is a good friend of mine, and... He had said that one time that he'd been to a food show and that vendors were there trying to, you know, get people that are in the grocery business to put these machines in their grocery stores. And, of course, he does not have the room for one. And so he mentioned it to the library when we had received money from a former volunteer. And so we decided that that was a good way to spend the money. Great. Um, so... Before I get to like patron reaction and, and, and how well it's been working for the staff, I, I, you know, given the economy, you, you probably had to have expected this question. How much did it cost? It cost us $6,000. But again, like I said, we had had a volunteer here at the library for years. She worked well into her 80s, and she passed away last year at the age of 99, and she left the library $10,000. <laughs> oh, hey, you know, this, this is why you want to make your patrons happy, right? <laughs> um, exactly. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so a patron can come in, um, bring in their camera, their, their, uh, their camera card, I, I would think, um, and uh, do this. I don't know how many people uh, on the call have actually uh, used one of these before, but about how long does it take? You know, once they stick their card in, what do they have to do? Well, it'll bring up all their pictures that are either on their CD or their card or, you know, whatever media they bring in, and 
however long it takes them to decide what they want, they can go in and they can edit the pictures, you know, make them bigger, smaller, you know, sepia tone, change the red <laughs> eyes, just anything that you can do like at your Walmart okay. photo kiosk. And, and how much they per Okay. Um, and how much do the pictures cost? We are charging 29 cents for uh, four by six, and we can also print uh, five by sevens. And uh, we haven't printed very many of those, so I think they're a dollar forty-nine or something like that. Okay. And does the machine take care of all the payment, or do they have to come over pay you? How 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 is that working? Uh, they come to the desk to pay me. Uh, okay. The screen will come up with a. It will say, ask the store associate for a password, so then I go over and type in the password, but at the bottom of the screen, it will tell me the price, so I know how much they owe. You know, we don't have to stand there and count pictures and figure all that. So, <laughs> so that's okay. Great. Um, and so what's been the patron reaction? How, how has it been going? Uh, we got this machine November 7th, and we are open 20 hours a week, five days a week. And I can honestly say that there have been three days that I have been open that has the machine has not been used. Wow. <laughs> so so pretty popular. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes. We I figured that we have we have printed off over fourteen hundred four by sixes and about oh, probably roughly seventy five by sevens. Well, that that was my next question. That's great. So, so does the machine keep statistics <laughs> for you, basically, or or is this your own count? It does. Uh, well, I've been doing it on my own count, but there okay. is a you can go in and do the statistics too from the machine. Okay, great. Um, have there have there been any specific comments from the patrons that you can remember that that would be fun to share about this? Well, of course, everybody's just happy that they don't have to go out of town to do it. And, you know, I have scrapbookers that, you know, uh, Saturday morning they're here ready to get started for the weekend. And great. I guess one of the things that I thought was neat was, you know, during deer hunting season, I'd have out-of-state hunters come in and, oh, got to have a picture of this buck I just got, you know. And so here it is, you know, they're just happy to have the picture to show around. And so that's been neat. Great. Um, have there been any problems, or has it been completely smooth sailing since day one? Completely smooth sailing. We have really? not had one problem. Yes, really. <laughs> I shouldn't say <laughs> oh, that I, I believe you. I'm just surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so am I. I'm pleasantly surprised. I said this machine has just been a wonderful addition to the library. Okay. Um, and, and a little bit more in the technical end, you have, um, I'm assuming, some sort of service contract with the company, so if it's, you know, breaks or something, somebody will come right in? We, or? Well, um, the machine was shipped to us on a, you know, a truck, delivered here, and I unboxed everything and got a little bit nervous when I, you know, looked at the... <laughs> the setup machine, you know, for it, and so I gave my daughter a call, and she came in, and between the two of us, we got it up, and we had it running within an hour, so, but as far as technical support, we have a 800 phone number to call, we can fax them anything that we have problems with, I mean, when I talked to this company the first time, I said I would like to have references, of course, and the company is out of Missouri. And so he gave me a couple different places here in Nebraska that they've sold machines to. So I called both of those places, and that was their their number one thing was that the technical support was exceptional, and that if they had to order a new machine, that they would go through the same company. So that alone there told me that this was people that stood behind their products. Okay, um, and um, when, one thing I haven't asked you is is what what company is it? What what brand are we talking about? In case other people are interested, it's a Mitsubishi, and we ordered ours through JR's Ventures out of um, let's see, O'Fallon, Missouri. Okay. Great. I mean, I, so. You you love the machine, obviously. Um, you're glad you put it in. What what yeah. what? How are you handling um, 
you know, you have a little bit of that budget left over, but what about long-term costs, uh, supplies, ink, paper? How, how, are you, how are you covering that? Well, the money that we take in off of the, the prints, it's just put into a separate fund, and so that money just goes back into buying supplies for the machine or, like, if we needed any upgrades or repairs of any kind, then that would just come out of that money there. Oh, okay. So it's sort of self-supporting. Right. Great. Um, I, I, I do want to throw it out. If anybody in the uh, audience has a question, if you'd like to do it via audio, just go ahead and, and give a hand raise, and I can turn your microphone on, or you know, feel free to um, put uh, something in the questions area in the um, GoToWebinar software. But um, so it took you an hour to set up. Um, you know, only one problem so far. I, I, I'd say this is a success story. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I would agree. Okay. Um, is, is there anything else you want to tell us about the experience? Um, you know, in, any uh, answers to questions I didn't ask? Uh, what, what any other library considering something like this might want to know? Well, it's a very small footprint. It's just two by two feet and four inch or four feet high. So it's, you know, very small area that you would need to set one of these machines up, but of course you have to have the the traffic flow available for people. So we just put ours in the corner of the library and, you know, it's out of the way of incoming. And <laughs> so I guess, you know, if you're worried about space, it doesn't take up a whole lot of space. Okay. All right. Um... Let's see. I'm I'm just looking at the article here to to think. Um, you, you, somewhat more of a technical question. Do you, can can you if if you and if you can't easily answer this, don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> what what formats of the cards does it take? Do you know, or will it take a USB drive? Um, the, yeah. Unfortunately, there's um, about thirty different card formats. So. <laughs> right. Um, what it tells us that it will accept is uh, CD, Bluetooth picture phones, and USB thumb drives. Wow, Bluetooth and CD, even. that's nice. Well, I, I have I, not I'm had anybody use those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know many cameras that support Bluetooth, but um, maybe camera phones, I guess, if somebody wanted to you know, take a quick picture on their camera phone and then right. print it out. Uh, yeah, right. I, you know. I didn't really, I, I'll tell everybody in the audience, I didn't really talk to Betty all that much about this in advance, and, and i got to say, I'm, I'm more and more impressed every minute I hear about this machine. <laughs> I, I don't think the service has been that good the few times I've gone down to Walgreens across the street and uh, gotten uh, uh, photos printed out. There's always something going wrong with the darn machine. So, um, Well, that's I'm another impressed. thing that my customers... My customers have said that they feel more comfortable coming in here to use it because there's not a line, of course. And if there is, you know, it's people you know. <laughs> sure. But also people that would be too intimidated to go to Walmart or, you know, Walgreens, whatever, and try to do it on their own, they will come in here and do it for the first time, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can step them through it, and they're comfortable with that. And so it's getting people more used to technical stuff. <laughs> okay. Have have you found most pe is there a a skew between needs help the first time versus just able to do it on their own? Um, you know, you can tell when people are comfortable with it. They'll ask when they come in the door if it's their first time, they'll say is this, you know, like the machines at Walmart and I'll say yes basically and you know, they'll just go ahead and start doing it. If they have problems, they know that all they need to do is ask and I can step them through anything, but for the most part, most people are familiar with how things work and can do it on their own. Okay. Um, I do have a question from uh, someone in our, our audience here. Um, have Have you, maybe because of the RVLS article um, or, or other promotions you may have done, um, have you gotten call any other calls from other libraries say, you know, asking you about this or... Um, no, not as far as phone calls. I have had a lady come over from Oxford, a, you know, okay. town that she said when after she'd used the machine, she said that she was going to tell her librarian about it. So ah. I assumed that that meant maybe I'd be getting a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> Great. 
Well, um, are there any other questions from the audience? Uh, Benny's pretty much answered mine. Um, while we while we give people a chance, maybe to to type in a question, um, give you one more chance uh, to add anything you think uh, people might want to know. Well, I think I've covered everything that I had kind of okay. noted, but I just I just think it's a wonderful service for a town this size. You know, it's something that wasn't available before and now it is and it brings new people into the library so oh you know I I this this is why I wanted to talk to you and and, and share this story I, th I think it's wonderful um, I had never heard of a library having one of these before and you know I kind of keep my ear to the ground with what libraries are doing <laughs> and and I was so happy it was in Nebraska um, and and just the fact that you 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 saw a need for your community and you were able to pull that off and uh, bring bring this in. Uh, you know, luckily the the funds were found. Um, that's probably going to be the big hurdle for for most libraries these days. Um, and it sounds like everybody's happy with it and everybody's excited. And, and I just want to, you know, I wish I could come in and print some photos off of your machine. <laughs> if I if I ever come well, through town, I'll I'll try to stop in and 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 use it and, <laughs> and contribute to the project. I mean, I. It's it's wonderful. It just I read that article and it just brought this big smile to my face, and I'm glad it's working so well for you. So are we. And if you're ever in Beaver City, stop by. I I will. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm not seeing any questions in the group. Uh, Betty, thank you so much for for talking to me. Uh, you're you're welcome to stay on for the rest of the session if you've got the time. Um, otherwise, uh, hopefully I will uh, run into you at uh, NLA or or come through town when I get a chance. Okay, thanks for thanks for the questions. Oh, you're welcome. All right, folks, that was uh, Betty Oliver from uh, Beaver City uh, Public Library here in Nebraska, and um, I I just I I can't say enough about that project. I think it's it's wonderful. I'm I'm glad they were able to find the funds. I I'd love to see more libraries doing that you know even even if you know you've got the the walgreens the walmart the grocery store having something like that um in your town you know why not offer that one additional service uh to your patrons i i think it would really be great and you know maybe i i one thing i i maybe could have asked her is, is how much control over the pricing they have but maybe you know if you can even reduce the pricing a little bit just to cover the supplies um and uh you know give another reason to your patrons to, to, to come on into the library. All right, so uh, it's uh, 10.22 by my clock. I have got some stories I want to share with you, and I actually got some uh, questions that came in. Uh, we like to try to encourage people to um, send in some questions, and I got uh, four questions from one person um, that I think I can answer. And um, let's see, actually, if she's Karen, you, you Karen, I did get your questions yesterday, and you're on the line. So. So um, I'm going to go ahead and do yours first, and um, Karen, I don't know if you're on a mic or not, but I'm going to go ahead and, and unmute your mic. Uh, if you don't have a mic, um, you can respond to me in questions, but Karen, are you there? You Mike, I'm a, trying a new a microphone, so can you help me? Can you yeah, hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear you just fine. Great. All right. I'm going to bring up your questions on the screen so, so everybody can, can see them here. And I thought they were wonderful questions. I saw them yesterday, and I, I immediately started taking notes uh, after I printed it out and, and, and thought I, I could help out with this. So it sounds like you guys are looking at some um, upgrades at the library, that the, the city is going to be involved, which I'm sure always adds a, a, a wonderful additional level of bureaucracy. Um, and so the first question you had for me here was about – a program to completely wipe out uh, hard disks before the city um, well, sells off the old machines. Correct. We do have an option. We had an option a few years ago. And I have some PCs that have been set aside and haven't been wiped yet just for backup. But if okay. an option comes up again, I do want to wipe them out first. Yes. Okay. First of all, before I suggest a piece of software to, to, to anybody in the audience or, or listening to the recording, um, this is important. Um, I've gotten rid of some old computers lately. Um, 
generally, in my case, they're, they're so old that I'm recycling them, so I completely yank the hard drive out. I actually have a drawer of spare hard drives. Um, I'm not sure what I'm ever going to do with a one gigabyte hard drive, considering I have a 16 gigabyte flash drive now. But anyways, um, but if you are going to donate a computer anywhere, if you are going to um, even recycle it, if it if it's you're going to keep the hard drive in it, you do want to scrub those hard drives completely. Uh, you want to make sure you know none of your financial information is still hiding on there. Um, you know, just anything you might have ever stored on that machine. Because we've all been told just because you deleted it doesn't mean it's actually gone. So um, on the bookmarks list that we'll link to in the recordings, um, there uh, the URL is up there on the top of the screen right now. It's delicious.com slash traveling librarian slash tech talk plus Jan10. Um, the one I've used in the past and the one that always comes highly recommended is called Derek's Boot and Nuke. This will completely scrub your hard drive so nobody's ever going to get anything off of that drive again. It doesn't make it unusable. It just makes it empty. Um, and part of your question was, can I put this program on a flash drive or um, I'll add a CD-ROM? The answer is yes. Um, you download this software, you install it to a CD, and then boot from the CD or you can install it to a USB drive, but you do have to make sure that that's a bootable USB drive. Um, and USB drives by default generally are not bootable. So I would just go to Google and, and search like how to make a bootable flash drive and, and you'll find some instructions. It's, it's not too difficult. Um, and then you basically, you, you plug in that flash drive or that CD, make sure you can boot from that device. This program comes up, you never even get to Windows. Um, and you basically say, you know what, scrub this drive, give it some time. The bigger the drive, the longer it's going to take. And when it's done, it'll say, I'm done. And you, you shut the machine down, try rebooting the machine just to the hard drive, and it'll basically say, this hard drive isn't formatted, there's nothing on it, what do you want me to do? So I would uh, highly recommend Derek's Boot and Nuke. Uh, it's pretty uh, bulletproof, pretty uh, very easy to use. So... There's your first question. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Your next question, which I'll bring back up here, is you're currently using Fortress 101. Uh, you're not sure you want to stay with that. Um, and you've taken a look at Clean Slate and Deep Freeze. Also, Win Select. I am not familiar with Win Select. Uh, I am familiar with Deep Freeze, and I am somewhat familiar with Clean Slate. Um, Basically, it's a toss-up. <laughs> they're, they're all pretty good. Um, I do know that Deep Freeze only comes as a software product, and I think Clean Slate, but don't hold me to this, um, might have a, a, a hardware version, which is more of the key style, if anybody had those old Gates machines, or in fact, some of you still have those Gates machines, um, where you can physically lock and unlock the computer if you'd prefer kind of the, the, the hardware version of that. Um, the only thing I might add to this is there is a free alternative called um, Windows Steady State. It's from Microsoft. Uh, we use it here in uh, the comu our computer lab, and, and I've recommended it to uh, many other libraries. Um, does everything these other software programs do, which is basically lock the machine so that if you boot it up, make all the changes you want, do whatever you want, you shut the machine down, the next time you reboot, it's back the way you set it up before. Um, it's completely free. Um, I've had no more difficulty or issues with it than any other software I've used. In other words, it's not perfect, but, you know, um, it, I think it works just as well, and it's free. So you might want to take a look at that. Thanks. And I did provide a link to it on the bookmarks. Okay, um, now we get a little more interesting. Um, you're considering upgrading to Windows 7. Okay, um, but, so you're not... You've pretty much decided you're going to get a Windows 7, or still not sure? Would like to move eventually. It's the timing, okay. and then looking at all the details and finding out that things like Outlook Express, which is what we currently use, 
will no longer be available and any other repercussions. Okay. Um, basically, okay, the, the larger issues of moving to Windows 7, and then we'll, with, with your fourth question, we'll get, we'll get in a little more detail about versions of Windows 7. Um, but I've been running Windows 7 since about day th three. Well, actually, I was running some of the beta versions. I've had pretty much zero problems. Um, of course, I never had problems with Vista either, and everybody else seemed to. Um, there is some older software that won't run on Windows 7. Um, they are few and far between. Um, I think my, my father just upgraded, and he was running, like, you know, Print Shop Pro version 12, and they're now on, like, version 25. Um, so he had to upgrade that, but you know, it, it just, it was 20 bucks and he upgraded it. So the first thing I would check is just make sure that any software that would be mission critical, the stuff you can't live without, um, says it'll work on windows seven. And basically if it works on windows Vista, it should also work on windows seven without too much trouble. Um, with Outlook Express going away, um, uh, you're asking me about the options between windows live mail and windows live hotmail. I've played with both of them. They're perfectly good programs. Um, in fact, some people think that, that the new Windows Live Mail actually worked better than Outlook Express ever did. Um, there'll be a little bit of a learning curve just because things will look a little different and work a little different, um, sh but shouldn't be too much of a trouble there. Your big difference between uh, Windows Live Mail and Windows Live Hotmail is where the mail stored, as I see you've kind of noted on your uh, your question here. Uh, Windows Live Mail, the window, the mail will be stored on the desktop, so you need to have access to that desktop in order to access your email. Uh, Windows Live Hotmail. Um, it's hosted out in the cloud on the web, so you can log in from any machine and get to your email wherever you want. Um, that, I think, really is going to be your choice. Um, upgrading from Outlook Express to Windows Live Mail, you might be able to kind of transfer those files over. Um, if you go from Outlook Express to Live Hotmail, not sure you might be able to move that. Uh, you might be able to export it from one and import it to the other. Um, I can maybe do a little more checking on that if you'd like me to, but um, it's really going to come down to how do you access your email, um, whether you want to be on a particular machine or you want to be able to get to it from anywhere. Yeah, I did see something about um, being able to move the Outlook Express mail to one or the other, and I think you're right. I think there was one that it was capable of doing it and one that wasn't. I don't remember the detail. Yeah, my guess would be is that the live mail, the mail that's on your PC, uh, would be able to convert from one to the other. Um, However, I'm, I'm guessing in your situation, you're going to be going from, like, computer A to computer B. You're not upgrading computer A? We will be doing a, a mix of that. Okay. Some we will be upgrading current PCs. Some will get a new, new PCs. Um, my guess would be is that on the ones you upgrade, the process will be simpler. Um, on the ones you move, you might have to, again, kind of do an export um, from the old machine onto like a flash drive and then move it over to the newer machine and, and plug it in and, and do an import. Um, yeah, I would, well, I would actually, do we do have an exchange server. So actually, our mail oh. should all be on the server. Okay. Sorry, then, I should have put that in the question. Okay, then I would probably just move to Windows Live Mail. Um, can you access the server from another machine? Like, um, if you're at home, can you log in and get your email? We currently, through our contract with a service provide with a, um, a computer backup soft, uh, program helper and stuff, they um, do provide a webmail alternative. Okay. Um, then, in, from the sounds of it, um, I would say just move to the Windows Live Mail. It's just the it's the upgrade to Outlook Express, uh, and just go from there. Have you heard anything about people who are using the Windows Seven with it's I believe something like a Windows XP shell? There's a way yeah. to still use XP well, programs. Okay, there there is in the ultimate. Okay, oh boy, you see here here's where we get into all the fun stuff of the different versions of, of Windows Seven. There's there's like a basic version you don't want that. 
Um, there's a home version, which I actually run myself, and, and that works just fine for 99% of all people. There's then a professional version and an ultimate version. Um, in most cases, the professional version and the ultimate version, besides costing more, will add features that most public libraries don't need. Um, one thing they will also add, which is what you're talking about, which is called XP mode, um, which I think comes with ultimate and can be added to professional, if, if I've got this correct. It is really only something you need if you have a very old piece of software that would only run in XP, would not run in Vista, and therefore will not run in, in um, uh, uh, Windows 7, and there is no upgrade to that software, and you've got to run that old piece of software. And there are very few cases for that. Um, okay. I, I would argue if that's like your OPAC, okay, then maybe this is something you want to consider. Um, you know, if it's, if it's a game for kids or something like that, I would say, yeah, I would honestly say save the money, buy a new game. <laughs> so that, that's kind of where I would go in there. Dovetailing into your fourth and last question, 64-bit windows versus 32-bit windows. Oh, boy. Um, there's a simple answer. There's a hard answer. Um, the simple answer is, honestly, I would go with 64-bit version of Windows at this point. The main benefit to 64-bit Windows versus 32-bit Windows without getting into all the technology issues is you can put more RAM in a 64-bit Windows machine. 32-bit um, maxes out at 4 gigabytes of RAM. 64-bit, I think you can put something like up to 32 gigabytes of RAM in a machine, which is insane, but it can technically be done. This, again, however, is you need to check your mission-critical software to make sure that you're not running something that you absolutely have to run that won't run in 64-bit. Um, I can name one piece of software that a lot of libraries use, and that is the OCLC Connection Client. I know this because my wife does cataloging from home, <laughs> and we got her a new 64-bit machine, and that software won't install. So what we ended up doing was we used the web client instead of the desktop client in that situation. Um, but 64-bit is pretty much the standard these days. You get a, a you know a Best Buy or something, you're going to get a 64-bit computer. Um, the only other consideration is on your upgrade machines. If you have a 32-bit hardware, you cannot upgrade to 64-bit Windows. You have to have hardware that supports 64-bit. Um, so that's one thing you'd want to check. Chances are if you're upgrading, especially if you're upgrading from something like an XP, um, you probably can't upgrade to 64-bit. But if you buy a new machine, I recommend at this point, unless you really have a reason you can't, I recommend everybody going to 64-bit at this point. Does that help? That does. Um, can the network support both 64-bit and 32-bit PCs on the same network? Oh yeah, yeah, not a problem. That's, it's, okay. it's, it's purely an issue of hardware and um, how much, it's called address spaces, it's how much RAM can be used, it's, yeah, the, the networking will be completely transparent, and in fact, to be honest, you, if, if you sat somebody down in front of a 32-bit machine and a 64-bit machine, they probably wouldn't even notice. They're, the windows looks the same, it, it's all under the hood stuff, so. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, did I answer your questions? That was great, thanks. Okay. Wow. Great, you're welcome. Okay, I'm going to put you back on mute there. Um, did anybody else in the audience have any questions based on those questions and my answers? Uh, if you want to drop something in the questions list or give a hand raise if you have a mic. Okay, I'm not seeing any there. I'm going to go ahead and close those up. Uh, let's save that. Okay, the other thing I got was from uh, Claudette at Adams Middle School Library. She's uh, not on the call, but I, I found this very interesting. Um, she basically sent me an email saying, I, I, I saw this new bit of technology. 
Um, what do you think of it? So I took a look, and, and I've got to say I'm intrigued. Um, this is the Epson Brightlink 450WI, and I will kind of get us past this video here. Let me find some uh, pictures. This is a data projector, and it, it does a couple of things that I think are really different. First of all, it, the projector itself is the smart board. I don't know if any of you have ever used these projectors where you project onto a special board that you've mounted on the wall, and then you can, you can touch the board, and that's, that acts like uh, your mouse, and you can bring up an on-screen keyboard, and that way you, the, the instructor at the front of the room can actually be at the front of the room touching the screen uh, without having to kind of step off to the side and, and access a separate computer. Um, Got to be honest, I've never really been a fan of those. Uh, I, I don't know why. Um, maybe because I'm not in a classroom all day. Um, maybe also because they were never really that big. Um, I, I, I would like a huge projection and have me stand off to the side than have a little dinky projection and me standing right next to it. Well, the first thing this does is that it, you don't require the board anymore. You can only, uh, or you can just project onto the wall, and and it it allows you to touch what you're projecting onto the wall, and that will work like a smart board, which I'm I'm just totally impressed with. Okay. Second of all, you can get projections up to 60 inches in in on the diagonal, so you're no longer projecting onto a small screen you mounted onto the onto the wall. Um, you can project a, a, a 60 inch projection right onto the wall. And if you look at, at these images here, notice that it has what's called a short throw. And this is something I've just learned about in the last couple of days, where in order to get a 60-inch projection, usually you had to put the projector like in the back of the room. You can hang this thing directly above where you're projecting. So it project, practically projects straight down onto the wall at just a slight angle. So it's, it's only hanging about two feet away from the wall where it's projecting. I, again, I, I was just blown by this as I'm reading through it. So basically, I got a, a wall in the front of the room. I can mount the projector right in front of the room, have it project practically straight down, and then interact with that projection right on the wall. I don't know how much this costs. <laughs> um, it's one of those, you know, contact a reseller to, to if you're interested in purchasing one of these. But it's probably not going to be that cheap. But, I, you know, I want to play with one. Uh, and I know we don't have the budget here at the, <laughs> at the commission to get one of these. Um, but uh, it, it just sounds really interesting, and I thought, especially those of you who uh, might be in school libraries, might be interested in checking this out. And I do have, uh, like I said, a link in my links list. Excuse me for just a moment here. So, so one problem with being on camera, you know, you got to suddenly pay attention to every single move you make. All right, any questions on that one? All right, um, let me go through a couple of other stories that I have here. We have about 15 minutes left, and I'm going to go ahead and, and scroll on down. Um, one of these is a service I don't think I mentioned last month. I want to make sure I mention to uh, everybody now. And if I did mention it last month, I want to mention it again because the offer on this is only good a couple of more days. Backupify is a service that backs up content that you're already putting online. So, for example, I have uh, photos on Flickr, uh, Google Docs, my Gmail, uh, my delicious bookmarks. Uh, all my tweets. Now, in the case of my Flickr photos, I also have them on my hard drive, and I burn them to DVD, and I back them up somewhere else. Um, my Google Docs, I probably have that too, but like my tweets, my Facebook stuff, um, my Gmail, I don't necessarily have a backup. And what if Twitter blew up tomorrow? What if Facebook 
blew up tomorrow? What if Facebook decided that they didn't like you anymore and canceled your account? Where'd all that stuff go? Well, if you sign up with Backupify, um, which I've done, I've been using for about a month now, they will actually back up that content to another online service called Amazon Web Services. And so if you ever lose, say, all of your Facebook content, you can get it all back. You have a backup copy of it. And this is going to start costing money come February 1st, but if you sign up before the end of January, you can actually use the service completely for free. So I'm kind of on a backup kick. Uh, my father, as I mentioned, just bought a new computer. That's because his old computer just decided to die. Uh, luckily, he backed everything up so he went onto an external hard drive, so he was able to pull it all back in to his new computer. But, uh, you know, how many of you are backing up your software and your data and your documents and your photos? Okay. By the way, did I mention you should be backing up all of your content? <laughs> Okay, um, a few other services, uh, some fun stuff, just want to throw this in here. Um, Waldo has been found. Does anybody know that? We all know who Waldo is, right? Okay, well, um, due to the wonderful uh, street view of Google Maps uh, or Google Street View, uh, Waldo has been found at 76 Putney High Street in uh, Wandsworth, London. And there he is. See? You never know what Google will find for you next. Sorry, just had to throw that one in there. I thought it was kind of fun. <sighs> Go back to my links list. Um, Firefox browsers. For any of you who are uh, Firefox users, I don't know if you've noticed, but um, the new version of Firefox, version 3.6, came out just uh, end of last week. Um, it's a good browser. I like it. I use it here at the office. Um, on my other computers, I'm kind of using Google Chrome, which at the moment is kind of still for the super geeky people. Um, but uh, if you are somebody who is not using Internet Explorer anymore, uh, which is something I will always recommend is not use Internet Explorer, uh, you might want to make sure that um, you're using the latest version of Firefox. If you've been using it, chances are you uh, have already automatically been upgraded. If you're not sure, you can just go ahead and click on Help and then Check for Updates, as I'm showing you there on the screen. And uh, that will check to make sure that you are at the latest version of Firefox. With that, um, what I might also want to point out is that the uh, portable version of Firefox has also been updated to version 3.6. I don't know how many of you have ever played with portable applications, but this is software you can download and install on your flash drive and then take it with you. So what I can do is basically go to any computer, whether I'm at a public library, at home, at work, I can uh, pop in my flash drive and should I need to, uh, let's say they don't have Firefox, uh, they only have Internet Explorer and I don't really trust that, um, I can go ahead and run Firefox completely off my flash drive. Uh, and leave no traces whatsoever behind on the uh, computer that I'm accessing. Um, and I don't mean traces as in like I'm trying to hide something, but it won't actually install anything on that computer. It won't actually change anything on that computer's hard drive, but I can run my browser, have my bookmarks, break, take it with me wherever I want. And there's lots of other software available like that, not just Firefox. If you go to portableapps.com, you can find all sorts of software uh, that you can take with you on your flash drive. Um, and I'm going to talk about two more things real quick here. Um, one... Uh, is a new piece of hardware that I'm totally excited about, so I just kind of want to share that. The other one is something with Google Reader. Um, this I love. I am amazed by this. This I, I discovered this, I think, two days ago, uh, th three days ago, January 25th. Um, I use Google Reader to follow RSS feeds. But not every website I want to pay attention to has an RSS feed. So how do I know if that website has been updated or not? For a real life example, I have a Sony reader and Sony has a web page for my unit where they post updates every once in a while. You know, not regularly, but you know, maybe every couple of months 
every couple of weeks. And what I'd have to do is I'd have to use some third-party add-on to Firefox that would check once a day to see if that web page has been updated and then notify me and then I'd have to go into that web page to see what the new material was and it worked but it was very kludgy. Well now what you can do if you're a Google Reader user is you can subscribe to any web page. So all I need to do is I went to the Sony Reader website I found the URL for the updates for my device I copied that URL, went back to Google Reader, said subscribe to this page. And Google said, hey, you know what, there's no RSS feed on this page. However, would you like us to keep track of it anyway? And I said, yes please. And so now, whenever that page is updated, Google will notify me in my Google Reader, at just as if it had an RSS feed to it. And I think that's totally amazing. It's wonderful. Again, it's now I can just pull everything into that one location and keep track of all the websites that I need to keep track of. So if you're a Google Reader user, check that out. Um, last but not least, this is just a device I'm totally excited about. It's called the BoxyBox. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my home life. Um, I don't actually watch much real TV anymore, um, one or two things a week. I pretty much get 98% of my television off the Internet, Hulu, Netflix, iTunes, all these sorts of resources. And generally what's involved, however, is uh, hooking up a computer to my television which is not necessarily difficult if you have a current television, but, you know, who, yeah, just what you want, one more computer in your house. So, um, you know, some of us don't want four or five in their house like I have. Well, there are several different devices out there. This is the one I'm looking forward to. It's going to be out later this spring. Uh, it's called the Boxy Box. That's what it looks like. Yes, it's a little weird looking, but you plug this into your TV, it supports Wi-Fi, or you can plug it directly into your network, and then you turn this thing on, you turn your TV to that input, and it is a complete interface to online video. You can get your Hulu, you can get your television uh, uh, through uh, uh, YouTube, you can subscribe to video and audio podcast feeds, you can listen to music through this thing pretty much plays just about everything. So, um, kind of looks like this, comes with a little remote, which also has a keyboard on it, it and this thing's going to cost less than $200. I'm looking forward to this. Um, it might actually replace the computer I have connected to my television. Worst case, it's going connecting to the uh, TV in the bedroom because that one's not on the network yet. So it's just something out there. I don't know if any of you, you know, actually want to go buy one of these things, but just to kind of show you the technology that's coming for getting internet-based video onto your television, this little box is going to cost less than $200 and do pretty much anything you could ever want it to do. Oh, and it works with Netflix, too. So I can pull in my movies, television shows, whatever, straight from Netflix. I'm just totally excited about this and maybe a little too excited, but I've already got the $200 set aside. I want one of these. So that's pretty much uh, my list. We had that wonderful uh, interview with Betty. Betty, I want to thank you again for that. I see you're still on the call. Um, answered a couple people's questions. So just some new hardware some people pointed me to. Uh, talked about a few uh, stories and pieces of software I think you need to be paying attention to. Um, we've got about five more minutes uh, in our hour. Are there any questions out there that either were raised because of something I said or not because of something I said? And it looks like we've got one floating around in here. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, this is a loaded question. How can I learn more about technology in a timely way? Maybe something guiding me along the way. It seems like I never find the time. Do you have favorite sites you watch? Okay, um, wow. Uh, well, okay, here's the loaded part of the question. Um, basically, if any of you are or... Uh, have in the past, are currently, but have kind of forgotten about it or hadn't heard about it, we do have the Nebraska Learns 2.0 project. Uh, basically, we have one service or site uh, a month that we go through. Um, we give you a little reading to do. Sometimes it's a video to watch. We actually write a blog post about it. You can get CE credit each month for this. Uh, 
just uh, you know search Nebraska Alerts 2.0 in Google. That'll come right up because the URL is completely uh, blanking on me for a moment. Um, other sites, I, I, favorite ones. Um, I, I follow hundreds of feeds. I, I follow lots of people on Twitter. I, I just I keep my eyes and ears open constantly, so this stuff just kind of comes to me in some cases. Um, but I'll mention two only because I'm thinking about them because I actually linked to them in this uh, week this month's session. Um, one is Life Hacker. Um, this is not just technology, although it's a lot of technology. For example, you can see up here, uh, use a pressure cooker for fast, healthy meals. I, this is this is so the, you could argue a pressure cooker is technology, um, but it also talks about you know Google Docs. You can now upload anything to it. So sometimes it's you know totally geeky stuff. Other times it's just how to get more out of your life, how to do things more efficiently. I think it's a wonderful site, and you'll get a lot of different tips and tricks um, for uh, doing these things. Um, the other one, which um, I don't remember which link I had it to. Yes, um, Read Write Web, uh, which had this Google Reader. This is more kind of that social web. Um, Twitter, RSS, Facebook, uh, Web 2.0, the social web, that's the kind of the stuff that they um, pay attention to. And I also read this site pretty much daily. Uh, so those would probably be off the top of my head my uh, two total favorites uh, at the moment. So, um, any other questions or comments? Uh, again, if you have uh, a microphone, just feel free to, to click the little hand raise icon there and bring that up. Um, or feel free to put a question in the questions area. Um, I hope I'm still sounding okay. I'm a little bit congested, and congested, excuse me, <laughs> and uh, the talking is making it a little bit worse. But um, uh, you know, I think I've I've survived the hour, and I'm glad the rest of you have too. Okay, I'm not seeing any uh, additional questions floating around uh, through GoToWebinar, and I'm not seeing any hands raised. So I'm going to go ahead and thank you all for attending and give one last thanks to Betty. I really appreciate you calling in and let me talk to you about uh, your wonderful new service at your library. And uh, Krista, I believe, will be back next week uh, with the next edition of Encompass Live, and I will be back next month with another Tech Talk. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.